So good afternoon and welcome everyone to the Minnesota Learning Commons webinar for February. Our topic this month is digging into digital literacy. My name is Mary Messicomer. I am the Minnesota Learning Commons administrator for this year, and I am coordinating that partnership between the University of Minnesota, Minnesota State, and the Minnesota Department of Education. So welcome, so everyone. welcome everyone. If you are, um, I am joining, uh, we are joined today by Plamen Mil Miltonoff from St. Cloud State University, and Plamen is an expert in the area of digital and information literacy, and we are so excited to hear from him uh, today. So just a few little um, housekeeping notes. If you want to have your camera on, we welcome that. If you prefer to leave it off, that is fine too. You will notice that there are little emojis on the bottom of your screen. You can raise your hand if you have a question. Um, you can also put questions in the chat and I will keep an eye on that and alert Plamen to points where there's questions. Um, otherwise, I'm going to ask you to stay muted so that we don't pick up um, any echoes and um, other noises from everybody's sites. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Plamen and um, welcome you to introduce yourself and um, tell us what we need to know about digital literacy. Thank you, Plamen. Sure. Uh, Mary, is it okay if I share your screen with the document? And that might be also the time to place the document in the chat session. So if somebody cannot follow well, yeah, because too small if, and it's mostly textual. If somebody cannot follow well on the screen, you're most welcome to open the document on your own computer. Um, I will explain in a second why I opted such format and not the traditional PowerPoint or any other presentation uh, software, any other presentation application. That's because I firmly believe, especially w working with uh, graduate students and you folks are at least at the level of graduate students that I firmly believe that the more information I give you, the better. It does not it does we don't have to absorb all of, all of the information today but this document that i'm sharing with you is more like a reference that you can use anytime in the future tomorrow in a week in a month and so forth then i want to disperse the notion that i'm expert as mary um introduced me because um i i don't think there are experts everything it's such a fast moving target that um I, I, I personally doubt that there is expert, somebody is expert in this field. Um, what I do though for years is I collect information. I'm very much about digital literacy. So I collect any information regarding information literacy, digital literacy, and currently about digital fluency. And those thoughts I can share with you via this document. So you can make up your mind and decide where is your heart. At any point, if someone um, disagrees with me, please do please do interrupt. If you um, need more, if you have questions, if you need more information, please do interrupt. Very possibly, I won't be able to answer the, uh, the the question, but I will take the information and I'll follow up and connect with you later on and and deliver. Okay. So I'm kind of trying to establish the ground rules um, because we don't have much time and we don't know each other very well. Um, for all these 20 years, when I'm talking about, especially about digital literacy, time is always scarce. Faculty tend to not give much time for topics like this. So 50 minutes will be incredibly short, which usually stress me out. I start speaking even faster than I usually speak and adding my accent at a certain point, you might not understand the word that's coming out of my mouth. So if this happens also, please do interrupt me slow me down and i'll try to understand that mary probably will allocate some other day or time to finish this or you just can finish the document on your own in any case so uh in red uh you see the plan for today kind of the crude points that i'll be leaning on when i'm uh leading you through this document and then i try to uh do in uh, times new roman 16 kind of the 
the headers of the different segments of the plan. But again, this is kind of very um, working in progress document more to help us reference rather than something ultimate less expert. Okay. So, um, I'm a refugee in this country. I had to escape rather authoritarian government. So it's very dear to me, uh, both intellectually, but also professionally. Uh, how do we address information? And there is probably absolute no reason to explain, to, to try to convince any of you after 2016, how incredibly important it, it became for us to orient ourselves uh, um, in, in alternative facts, as Kellowan called them. But also in the last year, the Australians had caught uh, peer reviewed journals being polluted with papers written by artificial intelligence, which means now that even what we consider it hardcore information, peer reviewed information is becoming very shaky. So I hope this will convince you how important it becomes to understand what is information literacy, what is digital literacy and why we should be digitally fluent. So um, when I was preparing for this whole chat with you folks, um, I was thinking how to approach it. And um, I was thinking of starting, you know, kind of in a time, a little bit like in a timeline, uh, as, because as, as I said, um, it's a moving target. Uh, information literacy, digital literacy, the definitions are changing constantly. Uh, people are seeing them differently. Uh, different disciplines are seeing them differently from librarians. Do we have to listen to librarians? So it becomes really very complex issue. So um, this is a quote, and I'm giving you everywhere links, references. This is a quote, I'm, I'm paraphrasing it here, uh, but it's a quote that they read somewhere that until the 1970s, we, we knew only one literacy, you know, reading literacy, right? How to read, that was the literacy. Uh, then pr probably also math literacy, right? We had to know arithmetic at least. So it was a very simple, bucolic, nice, relaxed life. And then naturally with the advancement of the computers, everything became way more complicated. So um, in 2014, um, I entered, and you can see uh, the block very conveniently names the URL with the date and time when I was entering it, entering it in the block. Um, the notion of meta literacy start prevailing in the, in the discussion of the American Library Association. Um, and meta literacy is meant, of course, as compilation of literacies. Um, it, 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 a moment came uh, when more and more people start recognizing, acknowledging that we cannot use information literacy as an umbrella term. We really have to start addressing the, the uh, uh, parts of uh, the different types of literacy, the different parts or types, I don't know what would be the, the, the right term to use. Um, in addition, new um, fields sprung out and Mary, if you can scroll to the next page, uh, namely to no too much, a little bit up, a little bit up, a little yeah, step st st stop here. No, yeah, uh, trans literacy and digital storytelling. Um, and I don't know if anybody, any of you, is interested in digital storytelling. I'm very interested in dig digital storytelling for more than six or seven years. Digital storytelling is m rather different than storytelling, uh, but you can see that some. Some researchers are seeing also um, now uh, connection not only between the different type of literacies, but also connection with other uh, newly sprung fields, which adds to the complexity of the whole issue. Um, so um, from the abstract, uh, where you can see new literacy skills in multi multimodal society, from the abstract of the author, you can see now, in addition to new fields being added also the multimedia component, which with social media just exploded, just turned the world into something totally different. Um, and then Mary, if you wanna scroll now um, down, uh, some of the authors are literally lining up 
this um, meta literacy types. Um, and now we have a raging argument. How, how do we, what order do we use? Uh, so it's not only that information literacy is not sufficient anymore, but if we have to consider other literacies, which one are in a higher order than the others? And I bolded for myself the ones that I, I find very dear to my interests, but I think it would be totally normal if from that long list, you find literacies that seem much more important to you. So you, now you understand why, I'm, why I mentioned five minutes ago that different people define differently digital literacy because they see the angles of their own, their own interests of their own profession. I also color it in red ecological literacy because if you click on the YouTube link that they added, that's a conversation that Brian Alexander hosted in his Future Trends literally three weeks ago. He hosts every Thursday at one o'clock Future Trends. If folks are interested, you must probably know who Brian Alexander is. I'm following him religiously because there's a lot to learn at, at his uh, fora. So he had Antonio Lopez um, at that particular um, uh, seminar, at that, at that particular event, a person that I've never heard before about. Uh, and he was talking about eco, eco, uh, eco media, not only eco literacy, but eco media, which means that since 2014, when ecological literacy was already making headlines, it now it's evolving in eco media. And I have to tell you that this person he's teaching somewhere, I believe on the East Coast, Antonio Lopez, made incredibly strong argument, um, touching on um, other, painfully acute issues like of course ecology uh, but connecting them so well that i won't be able <laughs> i won't be able to replicate so it would be well spent 50 minutes i promise you if if you want to uh, follow uh, that conversation and of course i know a young man um, by the name of alex dakov who is currently right now planting corals uh, he's trying to save the corals uh, which for me uh, also puts my faith into the younger generation. I mean, our generation makes so much uh, so much mess, you know, not only with literacy, but also with ecology. And I'm hoping that the younger people will uh, resolve it. So just mentioning, you know, uh, kind of, of, of flying around the whole concept of what kind of literacy do in our respect. So maybe if you want to scroll a little bit down to 2018, it's in green. Um, you can see that uh, publications started popping out, so it wasn't easier. It, it wasn't hard for me to catch and and collect in the blog. Um, meta literate learning for the post truth world. Now you can most probably can feel the argument hardening. I mentioned already Kellyanne, and you probably remember Kellyanne's uh, introduction to the world of alternative facts. Fake news are now uh, household uh, word that everybody knows. Uh, so it it really a kind of, in my opinion, hit us hard. I mean, we were talking for two decades since about 2000, about since the 90s, actually, about information literacy. But the talks apparently didn't help. We literally, pragmatically, we were not prepared for the for the perfect storm that will hit us around 2015, 2016 with the Russian bots, with the fake news and so forth. Mary, if you want to scroll just a little bit down to the top of the next page. Um, so, uh, by that article, um, th th that article also gives a definition about meta literacy and it now connects it very clearly. It says, Hey, um, we haven't done it right by our learners. Our learners, uh, either leave the educational institution, not very, not aware even, or they leave the educational institution, not very well prepared dealing with, um, with, with these issues. Uh, and yet, as you can see, my he next headline, uh, the last thing, supremacy information literacy. I information literacy for me, my impression after these 20 years, you know, watching what's going on around, literally around me at the library where I worked, was that it, it concentrated. It, it just kept staying. I mean, information literacy was the one that we're teaching students, even if 
it was concentrated in the 90s and it already it was already the second decade of the 20th century uh, now how exactly it is working with the media specialist at k-12 i would die to i would i would give my left limb because i'm writing with the right one to learn uh, what's going on because um, from the students that are coming here in the last five or six years I'm getting the impression that the information specialists at K-12, at least here in central Minnesota, in Minnesota, are doing a very good job. They're coming pretty well prepared about certain of how to search, for example, for uh, peer-reviewed articles and so forth. And um, it is difficult to believe that they learned it on their own. Most probably either a teacher at uh, the high school or the media specialist uh, taught the class. Uh, but here, they still kind of have have to absorb the 90 ish postulates about information literacy and yet technology kept evolving so i don't have to convince you that this is also literacy that's that's this that that's it digital literacy that they were supposed to also catch up with uh, so in italics i try to put in italics practically uh excerpts from the publications that i'm giving you urls to you're most welcome to go to the blog and look at the other excerpts that they've collected, or I'll try to click on the link in the blog and go to the source and read the whole article. I'm just trying to make uh, the life of, of my patrons uh, easier uh, with the blog. And um, in that um, information literacy link that you see in, in italics, um, I'm practically giving you now the uh, working. 2018 working definitions of information literacy and digital literacy um, and um, I'm giving actually my thoughts I'm sorry I'm giving you my thoughts here that uh, digital literacy became more like a new dress for information literacy so the courses start being renamed digital literacy but the content that was taught still was remaining constrained to information literacy and I found I find actually even today, this not very useful for our patrons, for our customers, for our students. Uh, we have to revamp very quickly our curriculum uh, in that sense, in, in sense of um, graduating further from information literacy, finding time also uh, to not only to explain to students what digital literacy is, but to uh, make them being able to critically think what digital literacy to to be able to recognize digital literacy what digital lit literacy is so when they leave the educational institution whether it's a high school or a college they would be able to uh sift through the facts in a, in a critical way and i don't have to convince you this is constantly in the news uh in the last couple of, couple of years the average american is not able to do this the average, average American still very easily falls victim to uh, false news and, and so forth. Um, so the next article that I'm sharing with you is from teaching to consulting. I think you have to go up, Mary, right after the lasting supremacy of information. Yeah, from teaching to consulting. Um, the, and uh, those are, uh, this is again information that they taught you might be interested. Uh, because it's pedagogical, it's it's um, school oriented, whether if it's high school or college or, or university. Um, so it is not separated by theoretical and pragmatic, but I'm trying to give you a mix of the big picture, you know, from 10,000 feet, as I mentioned last time when I was with you folks, and from 10 feet, you know, what pragmatically can be done? How can I turn my session from information literacy only into um, digital literacy. Um, that quote, the question is not about information literacy's validity, uh, for me is very important. It's not about obliterating information literacy, throwing it out, as a lot of people through the years had accused me that I'm for digital literacy. It's about growing further, it's about evolving, it's about including of course including information literacy in digital the in the digital literacy session but not being constrained only to information literacy we as professionals we as teachers should evolve we should catch up with the times it's the it's the third decade already see i'm 
still saying the second decade of the 21st century. We are already in the third decade of the, cent uh, uh, of the uh, uh, 20, uh, 20, 21st century. We are speaking about Web 4.0, Web 5.0, but we're still behaving like we're in Web 1.0. And if um, I'm speaking now Chinese, just Google it, literally. Go to Wikipedia and Google. Google Web 1.0, Web 2.0, and Wikipedia pretty clearly will, will uh, spill it out. So um, the next headline is how to move uh, beyond this calcitrant structure. Um, it might sound blasphemous, but I'll say it because I'm not, first of all, I'm not the first one who would say it. It's, speak, it's spoken in the corridors, at least, whispering that academia is the hardest one to move ahead. Academia is, is very conservative area which doesn't like changes or changes occur slowly and painfully. Uh, but we have to change. In order for us to deliver good education, we have to change. And that's why now I'm kind of giving you, um, again, as much information as possible. You can decide which one to, to use. Um, you can see uh, I deliberately put in red and I bought it the American Library Association Digitally, Digital Literacy Task Force uh, statement because it's a good departuring point. Uh, considering that it's from 2012, um, you can take it with a grain of salt or keep keep looking, keep asking, ask me if you want. I can ask them to see if they had evolved respectively, if, if they have had updated uh, their information. Uh, but this is practically policy wise what can be used right now if you have to develop some kind of some documents. Um, I don't have to probably tell you what IFLA is, right? IFLA, uh, you know uh, this organization, ISTE, IFLA, those are abbreviations that at least your uh, media specialist at, at high school, at K-12 uh, are must be familiar with. Uh, so they uh, deliver really very, very good information. In, in that sense, I have to say that I'm much more impressed with K-12. Um, ISTE is giving very good pragmatic advices uh, how to teach digital citizenship, how to teach uh, digital um, uh, digital uh, li li literacy and so forth. Okay, um, so if I was in your shoes, I was trying to think, what would I do if, if I'm in your shoes? And my first question would be, uh, plow and stop modeling our minds with unnecessary information, just tell us what to do in 2021, uh, which is a very logical question. Uh, and I can give you peace of my mind, but as I said in the beginning of the of this whole conversation, uh, this is my personal opinion, and it, it's not about right and wrong. And I also don't believe there are some, such things as experts. It's about literally forming, building your own opinion, because to a certain point, we are in uncharted territory. The changes that occur in the last two decades and even before that is placing us in an unch uh, uncharted territory. And as desirable as it might be just to pick up some blue blueprint, right, and follow it, follow the orders. Uh, unfortunately, at this point, we have to make our, uh, our decisions. Uh, let me just uh, stop for a second. Something popped up in the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh, it's much easier. You know, when I was um, 15 minutes before this started, for some reason, uh, American Beauty popped up in my head. I don't know if anybody saw the movie and remember it. It's Kevin Spacey at the um, McDonald's store. He's 42 and he wanted to get the lo most low paid job because he didn't want responsibility. He was tired. He was some kind of big shot that had to bear for two decades a lot of responsibilities. And all of a sudden he's like, I just want to follow. I don't want to lead. <laughs> so yeah, that, that's much easier. And and I think this is one of the reasons why we're stuck with information literacy, because most of us are either used or pressed to 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 follow. Uh, we don't have much breed breather to 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 lead, at least to lead ourselves, if not others. In any case, this is a totally different conversation. This educational leadership. We can talk about it. Um so the next, uh, the, down on the bottom, you don't have to move it, Mary, digital and information literacy, which is which and how they relate. Um, I was thinking that in order to respond to your question, what do we do in 2021? I firmly believe now that we have to familiarize ourselves as, as the best we can. What is information? What is digital literacy? How they differ? 
how do they relate so we can kind of reconcile what was mentioned above that we don't have to obliterate information literacy we just have to expand it now in, to include digital literacy or vice versa digital literacy to include information literacy mary if you want to uh, scroll now to the top of the next page and that block link which um, on the previous um, page uh, gives you practically details yeah that um, digital uh, hyphen information hyphen literacy um, that link uh, gives you digital and information literacy lessons highlights. But if you go to that link, you can get much more information about the uh, crude structure of how do you have to conduct your uh, digital and information lit literacy lessons. And I'm just giving you the highlights here just to kind of get a sense, uh, get you jumpstart your brainstorming uh, because uh, it's totally valid in my opinion if you go your own path i mean you most probably have also some kind of an idea what digital literacy is and must be and you can probably uh, narrate it and relate it to the students much better with your own words uh, than borrowing words from somebody else or borrowing the uh, examples which are in red right here like understanding top level domains right to understand what top level domains is. you might have much better example than the domains example um, and in the same blog post, uh, there are also links about the difference between both of them, uh, which again is not to make um, um, information literacy inferior. It's more like to uh, understand how you can combine them. And then what is really scary, or at least would be scary for me, is that other literacies keep popping up. I mean, web literacy, like I don't have enough, like plumbing didn't have me enough up there, like 20 other literacies to read about. Now I have to read also about web literacy. Well, that's the 21st century for us, right? We have to at least cover it. We have to at least have a vague idea. What is web literacy? How it is, how it is, how it, it differs from di digital literacy to make the conclusion, to make the decision for yourself, if in the skimpy minutes that you have in your lesson, uh, can you pay attention? Can you can you introduce the students to web literacy? How, how you can do it? Okay, um, scrolling down further, New York Times editorial of 2014, I think the dispute is important for, edu for educational institutions, so mind, this is not academician who wrote this article, this is a journalist. But even they are now bringing our attention. He's speaking about educational institutions, libraries in particular, uh, because it reveals the complexity of traditional literacy. So practically, more or less for me, he's repeating what we already covered in this document up, up there, right? From the beginning, we're talking that this traditional literacy of um, being able to read, being able to do arithmetics, died with the 70s. That's the traditional literacy. And now it's much, much more complex because the necessity of many other literacy were added. Um, and the next one, page 45, the next quote, uh, academic libraries are concerned. No, you went a little bit too far. Uh, just one, yeah. Academic libraries are concerned about the digital literacy of their users, but their programs continue to be focused on the information component is something that I'm my mouth is running dry the, the last 10 minutes to try to convince you about. So it's up to us, up to us. I mean, if the librarians don't want to evolve and move ahead, you as a teacher, I think, should have the stamina, courage, uh, interest uh, to move move ahead. That's what I read from, from people much smarter than me. That's what they shared. And this is 2015. This has been said in 2015, seven years ago. Seven years ago in 21st century or 70 years in the, from the 19th century, right? We start living in dog years. Isn't that funny? Okay. So um, the next one is digital literacy, information lit literacy, and connectivism. So um, as soon as in 2014, uh, people start now tossing that connectivism notion also in in the whole amalgam in the whole mixture of literacies um and it was why can you guess why why connectivism all of a sudden became a keyword and so important what happened in the first decade of the of our century the explosion of social media 
I mean, the, the world all of a sudden, uh, cell phones and after the end of the 90s, uh, cell phones, which became smartphones at the end of the first decade, that brought that, that word, connectivism. And all of a sudden, everything changed. We're communicating in much, much different way ne never known before, which influences also literacy. Not only learning about collect connectivism, but also learning how the connection with other fields, as I mentioned above, changes the literacy, the information literacy notion, which is now for me, digital literacy. Um, this techie librarian blog, um, that uh, quote, again, you can go and read actually the whole blog by this person. Um, I don't know if it's uh, um, what gender it is, but for me, it was an eye opener. Uh, it is too, too, um, too difficult to tease out the difference between digital and information literacy. There it is, what you're facing. Uh, or any of the other literacy of information. Even more importantly, we should be thinking of this literacy in insulation when we teach them. That's why I'm glad to see information literacy being redefined within the context of multiple literacies. So this person, this techie librarian believes again that uh, multiliteracy, we shouldn't go um, information literacy only, or we shouldn't use the umbrella information literacy. If we're going to use an umbrella, at least it should be meta literacies. Because otherwise it deceives the patron, it deceives our user, that information literacy, everything that matters. You know how student mind works, right? If it's not, it, if it won't be graded, why should I read about it, right? If it's just uh, uh, elective, you know, I'm kidding, I'm not kidding, you know what I'm, uh, what I'm trying to say. Okay, so uh, the next, um, if you can scroll just a little bit up, the next one is a Instagram um, a snapshot that they took uh, 2014. Um, somebody was giving the visual representation of what is important, what can constitutes digital literacy. And um, since my um, handout is extremely poor on visuals, which is not 20th century at all, right? I decided to give you some joy for your eyes. So there it is. <laughs> I mean, if you want, if you want, just go Google images and type digital literacy. Gosh, you would get it all. If you want, um, go on Instagram and type hashtag digital literacy. It, you, you will get it all. Why should I do this? I mean, you, you're you're literate enough to do it on your own, right? I'm, I'm thinking that if I give you this information, the textual information, which is still the heavy duty one, you would be able to extrapolate both languages and ideas. And that's that's why the Microsoft Word document and not PowerPoint. Oh, right, maybe if we can go to the top of the next page. Uh, beyond information literacy, again, 2014, um, those are, this um, uh, uh, University at Rochester, this is probably the New York system uh, university in Rochester. Um, they are emphasizing now how important it is to go uh, beyond information literacy, something that I'm, again, trying the last 10 minutes to convince you. And that's why, of course, the next, the next headline is digital literacy. So, ALA, American Library Association, 2016 on digital literacy. So, it's in um, italics. Uh, I won't read it. Uh, I don't know if you guys have heard Paul, Paul Signorelli. He's pretty well established in, in the profession. Uh, so he's leading a four week e course on digital literacy. So there it is. The American Library Association is now acting. They, they understand they have to um, do stuff. And then I uh, placed, Mary, if you can scroll just two, two hits down. I send you, um, I'm sharing with you a list. You can see 2017, 2016, everything that I can, I collected um, on digital literacy, because if you follow, uh, and it won't take you too long to read, probably half an hour, 45 minutes to go through these uh, links, uh, but you can see the evolution. And I firmly believe that it can give you sense. You start now feeling, you start feeling what is the digital literacy and where it's going? You know what I mean? Not conceptualize it only with your cortex, but literally a feel. Uh, okay, this is what people are arguing about. And uh, in the next year, this is what they decided. And I think this is very important if you want, if you want to develop your own feeling about this whole issue, digital versus information literacy. Are we going to go digital fluency and so forth? Um, naturally, I uh, shared with you also the new media consortium. I, I don't know if you're familiar with this, but EDUCOS, 
uh, Dosser organization, the AGCOS, of course, international organization, but it's extremely powerful and uh, powerful is not a good word, influential in the United States. At least I have this impression. I follow it religiously because uh, they might be wrong about certain stuff like immersive technologies, uh, but they're very right about other predictions. They 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 have very good uh, crew, and they invite very knowledgeable people. And that's why Educost and New Media Consortium, which is not anymore New Media Consortium, they, they were changed. They were bought. Uh, but uh, this is why I share this information with you. If you don't want to read them, get in touch with them. I'll squeeze the information for you. If you don't want to read all this information, I can I can outline it for you. But I think it's important again to develop your your own feeling uh, of where it is going, how it is evolving. Oh, hey, social media literacy, totally totally normal. I mean, uh, there are still um, librarians, there are still educators who firmly deny social media, and that's fine. I respect this because deep in my heart, I'm also a luddite. I also don't want the telephone. I also want to throw out the laptop. But the times speak otherwise. So social media literacy, whether you want to recognize it as a teaching method or you decline it, um, I, I really think that you have to be aware. You have to be aware of social media. Uh, uh, you have to be able to promote so social media literacy the least to be, to be able to um, uh, have an open line with your uh, constituency, which are students who are using social media. So it's inevitable. Uh, I mean, again, you don't have to use it for personal use, but professionally, I think you have to be familiar with it. Um, and I shared the quotes with you, which are getting longer and longer, but you're now more and more interested, right? <laughs> um, and, yeah, and especially if you're a Luddite like me, um, Mary, if you can go to the top of the next page, which one are you? Are you a social media worker, social media laggard, social media literate, or social media square time user? Uh, literally can help you figure out where you stand. And when you figure out where you stand, you can figure out then what to do with yourself regarding social media. For me, it's very much like uh, Alcoholic Anonymous. When you say you're, you're an alcoholic, that's the first step toward the nine step process, right? To, to to uh, overcome the, the the big issue. All right, next header um, is now that next that might make you nauseated. So if you are, just turn off your screen for a couple of minutes, breathe deeply, and you'll get well. But it needs to be put on the table. Critical news literacy, visual literacy, media literacy, fake news algorithm literacy, artificial intelligence literacy. And you don't need me from here on. From here on, if you just Google it, you can start literally kind of catching up. Uh, the predictions for the next five years in terms of professions, I can share this block entry with you if you want, uh, but it has a lot to do with artificial intelligence. And, and how, I mean, STEM disciplines, uh, there is no escape. They, they will have to hurt about artificial intelligence and deal with artificial intelligence. Okay, but even they are in disadvantage if we don't deliver them the literacy part because they would be missing the ethics, you know, the human part of, of artificial intelligence, which is extremely important, which is extremely important. Otherwise, we're getting sucked into, into these disputes. Are the uh, Silicon Valley moguls good people or not people? Of course, they're bad people because nobody taught them ethics too, right? And they're get, getting as greedy as possible and doing a lot of other stuff. Um, autonomous cars, are they safe or not? Well, if they kill people, again, this is ethics. This is not me mechanical question or, or computer question. This is ethics. And literacy is the place where all of the students across the spectrum on campus can be introduced to topics which otherwise they might miss. And when they go out in the field and start producing this, if they cannot think with their heads, that can have if not grievous consequences, but uh, complex consequences. Um, core principles of media uh, literacy education, very pragmatic, very practical quote uh, that you can start extrapolating both verbiage and ideas, you know, if you want to introduce uh, uh, your students. 
Uh, Dana Boyd, I deliberately put her in, in red. Um, she's very influential person from the first, from the first decade of the century uh, with social media, very interesting person. She insisted she writes her name with uh, lower cases like Bertolt Brecht insisted that Germans shouldn't have capitalized subjects. In any case, other words, <laughs> uh, I, I just like that. I mean, the, she, she's, uh, she's um, writing, I think, so well, exactly because she's, she's so eccentric, I believe. So I like her very much. So she writes about tribalism. I don't know if you guys read Fukuyama. He's a historian. In my former life, I was a historian. That's why I'm so interested about looking from everything from a historical perspective. Uh, but that also, for me, gives arguments why do we have to understand now this new literacy? Because we're going into tribalism. This country, everybody says, never has been as divided as it is right now. That's the tribalism, right? And the media, in media, everybody knows now that social media contributed extremely to this division. So in order to overcome it, yeah, it might happen naturally, but I, I bet more actually on media literacy to understand uh, so we can reconcile, so save the democracy. Uh, media literacy and fake news. I can talk another 50 minutes just about that. I just mentioned the Russian bots. Uh, you know, it, it's so complex now and it evolves so fast that unless at least we know what's on the surface to uh, raise the attention of our students so they can continue to explore on their own, then I'm thinking we're not doing good service to, to our uh, patrons, to our constituency. Um, and then I'm giving you, uh, yeah, Mary, if you want to go one uh, to the next, uh, to the top of the next page, uh, K-12 media literacy. I'm giving you now ISTE, also a very, very pragmatic uh, information that you can literally follow it. Uh, you can contact people from ISTE. I'm absolutely confident that they would uh, most probably give you at least directions if they cannot work with you. Uh, and because, Mary, how much time I have? I'm probably running out of time. Trip. Yep. Sorry, I was looking for my unmute button. Yeah, you've got um, about nine minutes left. Okay, so a couple of more minutes so we can discuss it after that. Digital fluency. Digital fluency is very much on my heart because I really believe we, at in 2021, we must talk about digital fluency. And please, please go Jennifer Sparrow. If you scroll a little bit down, Mary, uh, Jennifer Sparrow, she's still, I believe, University uh, U of Penn. Uh, she has uh, Educos articles. Uh, she was at Brian Alexander uh, 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 Future Forums uh, explaining what, in her opinion, is di digital fluency. Bottom line, what I got from her is that it does not help to be only digital literate anymore. You can understand it, but if you cannot apply it, what good is it for? And that's why she makes the distinction between digital fluent and digital literate. Fluent means being able to apply it. And it, in, in, all of you, uh, I hope, will agree that this is a stretch from just being digital literate. How to apply it takes practice. I mean, this is at least another half of semester, at least two or three more weeks, you know, of hands-on exercises. So in that sense, um, I think that we are way beyond information literacy. We're way beyond digital literacy. We have to talk digital fluency. Whereas it does not negate information in digital literacy, it includes in the package of digital fluency is included digital literacy and information literacy. And of course, your main objection would be where I'm going to find the time uh, to uh, in an overloaded curriculum to to uh, place this. Uh, but this would be a conversation. This will be a topic for another conversation, I hope. Uh, then you say, uh, then you see uh, people are talking about digital assessment literacy, uh, which is very interesting for me. For three years, I was going to a conference just to start the conversation. When we use new educational technology, how do we assess them? I mean, does it does learning really happen? Because what's happening all across the board at K twelve and and higher institutions like. Oh, goggles. Oh, it's so cool. Oh, virtual reality. But how do we know that it's better than the old fashioned chalkboard or whiteboard of, of teaching? So that's for me, digital assessment literacy becomes also very important. If not for the students, although it's important for the students also, because they would be the tomorrow creators of content, whether as, as teachers or at the corporate world. 
um, it, it's, it is important for the instructors themselves. The instructors uh, here at the doctoral program that I, I told you that I'm working with K-12 uh, principal and superintendents, I prepared for them a um, course to leave technology literate. So when they buy these 2000 smart boards that Minnetonka bought <laughs> ridiculous in 2012, you can calculate how many, how, how many thousands of dollars they have to make the right decision. And more and more, this would be um, a necessity since exactly as uh, people are pushing right now to fi for financial literacy, meaning students knowing how to do their tax returns, mm -hmm. in the same fashion, they have to, a technology literacy have to take place. So when they go to the store, they know what kind of refrigerator to buy because refrigerator is now also computerized. Everything is computerized, computerized, internet of things. You, you folks know what I'm uh, mentioning. Um, so yeah, uh, um, Mary, if you want to scroll back literally three days ago, that popped up on my Twitter account, scroll all the way down. So this lady is promoting her book. And I thought that it would be nice to finish with the visual. So it won't be only text. Uh, is the certified educators? I don't doubt it. I mean, I know that people know uh, there's uh, people here who know more than me, and I know that there are people who disagree. You don't have to agree with me. I'm just sharing my my experience. I'm sharing my knowledge, my information, and I'm always um, uh, open for a good debate. Plum and I was just pointing that out because I happen to have my ISTE certification and I know Maggie Velas goes on here with me. We were in the program together and this is a big area for ISTE um, as well with they've got a new kind of a new take on digital citizenship that um, they've kind of revamped their thinking about it. So that's the only reason I mentioned it because it was flowing with everything else you were talking about there. Absolutely. I have deepest respect to ISTE. Again, with uh, please don't accept this a criticism. Again, they're their organization. And uh, although bureaucracy seems very negative, but there is bureaucracy everything. Like ISTE sunk uh, into bullying when they were talking about digital citizenship. And digital citizenship is much more. I understand that cyberbullying is very important in the last decade, but you cannot neglect other issues. Again, this is the, this are just my impressions, but overall, ISTE is a great organization. They're very well um, organized and they deal very well with all of the issues uh, that are hitting uh, K-12 in the last two decades, I believe. Uh, Plum, and there was also a comment here from Lisa. She said, um, I think when you were talking about that idea of um, algorithm literacy, Lisa mentioned Google, they cooperate with the left to control how their algorithms complete search requests. In other words, they withhold information. So that's um, I, uh, an interesting idea too. I can agree with everything said except um, isolating the left because uh, the uh, debate will turn political and I really think that it should be kept technological. Uh, it's not only Google. Uh, I mean, when um, when the black guy got killed in Missouri, I, I don't remember the town right now. Uh, it was proven that Facebook was tweaking its algorithm because Twitter right away was littered with uh, postings, and uh, Facebook only on the next morning, six o'clock, start uh, releasing the posts uh, about the event. Um, it is for me. Uh, it would be very unwise uh, to approach uh, the, the issue in a partisanship manner uh, because uh, the, the problem are the tech giants. And, and if uh, the left is supporting it and the right is not supporting, they're getting divided. They cannot pass a law. And the European has already passed laws about this. The European uh, uh, Union has very strong legislation. Facebook, not surprisingly, last week wanted to shut off Facebook and Instagram, you know that. And it's exactly why Australia also had issue with Facebook. My point is that uh, we have to be united about this, not divide ourselves uh, by, by trying to blame each other. We have to somehow reconcile uh, whatever spectrum we are left or right 
and figure out uh, how to deal with the tech giants because they're uh, getting uh, out of the control. I mean, their uh, their earnings are bigger than many countries, whole countries in the world. So it's harder and harder to control them. Uh, and this is also literacy, by the way. Digital literacy for me is also uh, issues like um, uh, net net neutrality. Again, net neutrality is very easy to turn it into a political issue, but it's not about political issue. The fact is that United States is way behind um, uh, Far East, uh, South Korea and Japan in terms of, of network connections. I mean, we still pay uh, five times more than Britain. Britain, um, I can give you the block entry. I have this information. 2008, uh, we split. Uh, Britain and United States were pretty much on the same path. And then United States went into monopolization of network access, whereas Britain uh, kept the uh, market, the, the traditional capitalist approach. And right now in uh, Britain, they have much better internet, much cheaper internet than the United States. I mean, uh, you folks probably from the Twin Cities don't feel this, but uh, St. Cloud, we have only practically only one provider and 100 miles northwest of us, it gets even worse. A and we cannot claim anymore that the United States is the most developed country in the world. So in any case, um, it's not that they disagree with you. I'm, I'm just thinking that uh, there are issues that, that we have to resolve together. Well, it's an issue of censorship. Do, do you support the censorship, you know, that's that's happening throughout the country? and. You know, I mean, I put the left, but the truth is it's, it's the, the, the tech giants are cooperating with both the left and the right. You know, it's a it's a global it's a, a globalist agenda that they're that they're cooperating with. And uh, unless you have a particular point of view, it's very difficult to get information. Um, I have been trying to do this ever since. Uh, the internet developed because my red pill moment um, was actually in the 90s when I basically gave up legacy media. Um, and uh, so, you know, I have been developing a system, you know, for, you know, 25 years. And the left and the right are, are on board, you know, with the tech censorship. And by the way, what you call that you know, what do you call that when the government cooperates with private corporations? I think we have a word for that. Um, but basically, it's very difficult, you know, to get information uh, about issues. So, I mean, we're, we're in a time of incredible censorship. Um, what do you have, you know, what would, you know, what are your thoughts on that? I, I would be careful and I'll tell you right away why. Right now, um, um, again, with the renewed um, tensions in Ukraine, uh, when the Crimea was when Crimea was annexed by the Russians, a lot of fascists and Nazis was tossed around between uh, Ukraine and uh, and Russia. Both of them suffering from the Nazis, which devaluates the notion. I mean, next time you call somebody Nazi, rightfully, it will be dismissed when it was watered down by calling somebody unrightfully Nazi. Nazi. In the same sense. We have to be careful when we label something that is censorship, because I had this argument yesterday with my neighbor. Um, he was saying, but what about freedom of expression? What about the First Amendment? Well, there is a very, sometimes there is a very fine border, border between anarchy and freedom. And it has to be very carefully measured if it's really censorship. Uh, in, the, in democratic societies, and I lived in both societies, and I have to tell you, I see the weaknesses of United States of democratic countries, but I will never, ever, ever think of going back to uh, my country uh, d during that time or current Russia or current Turkey, because these things happen slowly. I, I know how you feel because a lot of people around me is, share the same sentiments. But I believe that the pain is exacerbated because of the prolonged process of resolving these issues. That's an inherent, inherited weakness of democracies. Democracies are, this is why they're democracies, because they're deciding democratically, which takes time. An autocratic state, Erdogan in Turkey, he says, that was a coup. Everybody in prison. Boom. In three days, everybody's prison, in, in prison. 
he can say, this is a censorship. This is not a censorship. And everybody follows. But well, I mean, that's happening. I mean, when Jen Psaki can say, you need to censor these people and the tech companies do it, uh, that's where we're at. I, I don't entirely agree because when they do this in United States, differently from other countries, the people who feel uh, offended or uh, this, this positioned, they can contest and it takes time, but they can contest. They have the right to contest. Sometimes they win, sometimes they, they lose, which for me, it, this is the big picture. This is what needs to be seen and not take the moment out of context of the longer time context and say, well, we th this is censorship. Do unfairness occur? Absolutely. Th that I would never argue with you. Do, uh, do people get gagged? Absolutely. It was proven, and I can find you this block entry five or six years ago. It was proven that big companies deliberately sue small bloggers who are bringing out information, not to sue them, just to scare other people not to do it. So this is practically censorship also. Well, uh, you know, the most published scientific researcher and medical doctor on COVID and on in, in cardiology. Um, he has, you know, you know basically his, his name is Peter McCullough and um, he cannot get on legacy media. He is the most published physician in medical history in his field. And he is the most published scientist on COVID. He cannot get on legacy media. Do you support that? And I have Lisa, Lisa and Plum, and I'm going to interrupt um, simply because we are at time for our webinar. And I understand um, that you would want to have this discussion, but I think it's maybe a little more appropriate to take it offline with Plum and if you'd like to continue it. Um, because I want to be respectful of the other folks that are on the webinar with us who may have questions for Plum and. So I'm going to just politely ask that we, um, um, Lisa, that you can circle back to Plamen at some point. And if anyone else has any questions for Plamen on what he's presented, um, I just invite you to um, ask that at this time. Um, I would love to take questions. I just want to mention, I think Lisa dropped out. I think she's frustrated. I definitely yep. would like to continue the conversation. Yep. You're absolutely right that we have to do it offline. It wasn't fair to the others. I apologize to the others. No worries. No, no worries, Plum. And I just, um, I just felt I had to be respectful of the rest of the audience Indeed. at this point. Indeed. So, yeah. But I can connect you. I have Lisa's registration and her email. I can connect the two of you. Um, up if you'd like to continue that discussion. So, I, I really hope I didn't disappoint the others. Yeah, not um, at all. Not at all. People feel strongly about these things and that's perfectly okay. Yeah, it seems that people are um, have to go to their next meeting, but um, all this information is yours, folks. If you need more information, that's why I collect it. I collect it for you. I, I cannot carry it with me in the grave, so. Yep, and we will share that out. We'll share the recording of the webinar with everybody who registered. Um, and at this point, we will um, thank you so much, Plamen, for all the work you put into preparing for us and sharing the information with us. I, I could listen to you for another hour easily. So um, I think that I hope our audience enjoyed that as well. Well, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Would be great, yes. yeah, if we can continue. Would love to. Thank you. So, yep, thank you. Thanks, Dave. Got some virtual applause there too, Plamen. Thanks, Loni. Yeah, thanks, Loni. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sorry. I should have probably be more, but yeah, no, I, no, no. I get these no. involved into discussions. <laughs> no, no worries. You know, people feel strongly about these things, and that's complete. Like I said, it's completely fine. I just felt we were kind of entering in a realm there where I, I just needed to interrupt it to give the rest of our audience a chance to ask a question. But as I mentioned during so. the, the, the meeting, I think that uh, we're at this situation exactly because we haven't done in the last 20 years good mm -hmm. literacy sessions. Mm -hmm. I and, think you're right, yep. And, and try, right now we're so, um, and it's not that they disagree. I, again, I have a lot of friends who think like this. I love arguing with them, but I'm a big picture guy. I mean, if you mm -hmm. look at it from mm -hmm. above, 
uh, like with the doctor, um, as, as she mentioned, um, for me, um, it's kind of myopic is not a good word, but this is very fitting word. You Absolutely. Very myopic. I was watching the German TV, um, some uh, guy who is a medic, but also historian, and he absolutely specialized in a history of pandemics. <laughs> that probably happens only in Germany. And that guy was uh, practically the thing that struck me. He was saying when FDR resolved the polio in the United States, it, it showed that this is good, right? I mean, nobody argued. Uh, Elvis Presley came out, you know, right? Early 50s. And the guy said in Germany, it had to take 30 more years until this <laughs> people, people were convinced that. So that made me think, right? Now, all these mm -hmm. arguments that we have for another five years, this is a bleep. I mean, mm -hmm. by the 70s of this century, probably it would be finally resolved. Until this point, uh, we will be clashing with each other and. Uh, and then I lost interest, you know. <laughs> yep, yep. I get it. I get it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank well, you. thank you again so much. And I'd love to have you back. Um, you know, in a maybe in a maybe for next for our next year's series too. I'd love to have you back and and see how things have changed or see what new things are are out there too. Well, Mary, I don't know if. K-12 will be interested. We were very interesting when we took the grant. We just finished the grant on, on introducing um, the faculty and um, uh, IT people to immersive teaching and learning. Oh, cool. Okay. So, um, one of the participants in our grant, she had gotten at Moorhead before that a grant to work explicitly with K-12 teachers with Google Expedition. So, um, if this would be of interest, again, this is a trend that's not going away. Uh, EduCost failed to predict well in 2016. They said in three years, now this year they're saying in another five years. Um, but uh, I mean, with uh, Facebook renaming itself, itself Metaverse, apparently that yeah. would be a big push. So, yes, but. absolutely. No, I think the K 12 community would probably really benefit from that too. So, yeah, so I will. Um, we'll be in touch. We're also going to have a um, a virtual e-learning summit, Plamen, in the summer, um, like we used to do in person. But we're going to do it because we're still just not sure about getting people together. So we are going to have a virtual um, summit. So I'll be in touch with you too about maybe a session there Good as well. To. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, thank you, folks. Don't want to keep anybody. Thank you. Nope, thank you so much.